I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss the latest from across the battlefront, update on Russian mobilization, and we talk in detail about the rising nuclear tensions between Russia and the West with our guest, Hamish de Breton Gordon. We are facing a very serious crisis in energy caused by Putin's war in Ukraine. Nobody is going to break us. We are strong. We are Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 27th of September, Day 215. And today, I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols, Assistant Foreign Editor Venetia Rainey, and former NATO Commander Hamish de Breton Gordon. Dom, can I start with you? What are the latest updates from the front lines? Well, hello, David. Hello, everybody. It's been another incredibly violent day up in the Donbass and in the northeast of the uh, um, of Ukraine. I mean, there's still the the push in the south around Kherson, we, we seem we think that Ukraine is making slow incremental advances there, not taking too much risk, not not pushing forward, not trying to make any lightning breakthroughs like they did in the north and risking any any of their um, any of their personnel and equipment down south. They seem to be holding that at the moment. That the 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 violent movement seems to be in the in the northeast, so around um, Liman and to the um, and to the west of kind of little chance of the Netsk area. Um, as we said before, we think that Russia have kind of pulled back to try to hold a defence some some miles, some kilometres east of the Oskil River, because that's how, how the ground lends itself. That that line is under extreme pressure. It's very fluid. It looks like Liman is, if not encircled, but certainly has forces to its to its east and to its north and north and northwest. Um, so, I mean, but take, you know, surrounding the town is one thing; taking it is quite another. But it looks like. Ukraine might be trying to bypass that to really push into, really bite into that Luhansk um, uh, oblast up there. Um, elsewhere, up in the north, uh, there's um, there's uh, increased concern about from from Ukrainian forces. This is increased concern about what Russia might be doing over the border, uh, the Kharkiv border that that um, up to the north of the in Russia itself. Um, we've got a story online today. Our, our our correspondent Roland Oliphant, you would have heard him many, many times on this on this pod. Um, he's up there at the moment with Julian Simmons, our photographer, and uh, they've been speaking uh, to the commander of the the, of the area around there, Brigadier General Sergei Melnik, who's saying that Russia are massing on the border over in on in um, on their side of the border, firing shells, uh, uh, as in artillery as well as tank shells, in the kind of indirect fire role, um, and drones coming over. So whether or not this presages some sort of push from Russia up there. Uh, I, I don't I doubt it personally because they this is not this is unlike them. I think this is harassment fire rather than any, anything more meaningful. We we know that they are very they would they very loath to do anything unless it's led by artillery. So uh, we we'll wait to see what's happening up there. But of course that might just be a that might just be a Russian effort to try and draw some of the Ukrainian troops away from that push around Liman um, to go further north to to hold that line up there. Um, also today, uh, we've seen so there's still huge queues to get out of the country. There's massive queues at the Georgian border. There's reports that there are Russian soldiers there, there now handing out draft notices for anyone um, trying to get out. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Um, a colleague from The Economist was down there saying that he'd seen, um, or not just not exactly in 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 that area of Russia. Sorry, I've completely completely mixed it up. This was. Um, uh, Oliver was talking about moving um, into Zaporizhia, so apologies for that. But yes, so still huge queues in Georgia. I mean, Maxar Tech, the the satellite imaging company, satellite intelligence company that we've all we've all seen the product over the last few months. I mean, they they are showing images. This queue, this sort of fifteen mile long queue of traffic to get out of the to get out of Georgia. I mean, if, if it's visible from space, it gives you an idea of the of the scale here um, as people trying to flee the country. And I mean, it's just just. It is extraordinary that that um, th- these are scenes you would expect from a country that is being invaded, not a country that hit, that has that is the invader. People are trying to get get away to to not participate in the in the fighting. Um, and just finally, the today's the last day of the the referendums that are happening in the in the four 
regions of Ukraine, so Luhansk, Donetsk, uh, Zaporizhia and Kherson. And just in the last hour, the Russian imposed governor of Kherson Oblast says that, that, that they, they voted in favour. Um, no numbers yet on that. Um, unsurprising, I would suggest. Um, if it's of interest, it'll be interesting to see what the, what the numbers are. But I think we've all sort of it's been derided as a sham sham referendum by the British Foreign Office. I think that's probably accurate. Um, so we'll wait to see what the what the numbers are. Um, and uh, and just one so one final point. Sorry, I should have said as part of people trying to get out of Russia, a very strong statement here from the the Kazakh president Tokayev, uh, Tokayev of, of Kazakhstan, who said that his country will ensure the safety of Russians fleeing what he describes as quote a hopeless situation. Bearing in mind that this was a country and this was a president largely bailed out by Putin, sending in his troops under the banner of the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, what Russia would like to style as as a kind of NATO equivalent. There is, there is no equivalent, but it's their, their Collective Security Organization. Tokayev was, was, was bailed out in January this year, and here he is um, less than nine months later, or uh, about nine months later, really turning on, on Putin. Very, very strong language there. So it just speaks again of that, um, of this waning uh, Russian influence on its near abroad in terms of uh, security umbrella. Uh, I'll take a pause there. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Tom. Uh, Venetia Rainey, can I turn to you? What other updates from around Ukraine and Europe do you have for us? So one of the big stories that we're looking at today are these stories about these gas leaks from the Nord Stream pipelines. <clears throat> You'll remember that Nord Stream 2 never came online. It's supposed to connect Russia to Germany much more quickly. Nord Stream 1 has been online for a while, but has been paused since August for maintenance updates, unspecified maintenance updates. Everyone quite widely believes that this is Russia trying to weaponize energy in its war against Europe more generally, for siding with Ukraine. What we've seen today is is quite a lot of several instances of damage on various pipelines that people are saying is unprecedented and really rare. So we've seen damage to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline in Germany and damage to Nord Stream 1 pipelines that supply Sweden and Denmark. Sweden and Denmark have had to restrict shipping due to the possibility of leaks. Just because these gas pipelines aren't working right now, that doesn't mean they're not still really dangerous for damage to be done to them. They're all holding gas under pressure um, at all times. So Sweden and Denmark have had to restrict shipping due to the risk of leaks and possible explosions. They've also restricted some air flight around um, the area. Everything spe everything speaks against a coincidence was what one source told a German newspaper. Um, if this is true, then it's a really a stepping up of Russia's using of energy as a weapon in its war against the West to be sending out people to purposefully sabotage these pipes is quite something. Um, some other things to mention. So, as Dom said, the referendums are ending today um, in the four occupied, newly occupied regions in Ukraine. We believe that Putin is going to announce the formal accession of these regions very quickly. He's got a big speech to um, Russian Parliament this Friday, so he might formalise it then. We might also hear something before then. Um, and this mobilisation order is having all sorts of, you know, funny side consequences on top of all the cues that we're seeing at the borders leaving Russia which as Dom rightly points out you can see in satellite pictures there's thousands of cars just queuing up at the Georgian border for example um, but people also fleeing into Mongolia really leaving wherever they can and the reason that you're hearing people going into countries in Central Asia a lot is because a lot of the biggest conscription efforts have been focused on poorer areas in Russia particularly areas where there are ethnic minorities they're seen as less powerful, more vulnerable, you know, less likely to resist, poorer and therefore, you know, more willing to just say, yes, OK, um, if I get paid for this, then fine. Um, but one of the other consequences that we've seen the mobilisation is, so for example, the Russian propagandist was trying to fly out of the country and go on holiday um, and they were turned down at the border and they went on a rant on social media saying, you know, this is one of the bad side effects of mobilisation. There has been quite a wide backlash against mobilisation in a lot of parts of Russia and not everyone thinks that this has been a good move for Putin. We've heard already um, that Russia has admitted that lots of errors are being made, dead people being signed up, you know, Description orders being sent to people who are injured, too old. Um, so it's it seems to have been very hastily done to respond to Ukraine's gains around Kharkiv, potentially. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Finisha, for that. It's hugely, hugely appreciated. Um, 
nuclear tensions are rising again. We spoke about it a lot yesterday on the podcast. So it's great to have Hamish Bratton Gordon, uh, former commander of the CBRN forces from NATO, back on the podcast today. Um, just before um, we bring you in, Hamish, Dom, you've written a big piece for the website yesterday um, on on the nuclear te- tensions. Can you just refresh our memory on where we are, um, just so we can set up how the um, how, the, how, how we see what's, what, what's playing out at the moment before we bring in Hamish. Yeah, sure. So Sunday night, Jake Sullivan, who's the US National Security Advisor, gave an interview <coughs> to meet the press on CNN. But gave an interview in the, in the States in which he said that were Russia to use a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, there would be, quote, catastrophic consequences, unquote. So there's been a lot of debate about, well, what, what does that mean? Um, how far off, uh, how far away from sort of useful ambiguity does that take America, and and what, uh, you know, literally, what sort of practical results might this might this result in? So I had a look around yesterday. I asked a few a few folk. Um, we got a piece in the paper today. Spoke to a number of number of think tanks. Uh, Bob Seeley, one of the MPs here, who's a, a long time Russia watcher. In fact, lived in Russia and Ukraine for for many years. Um, he was a journalist, a soldier, now now um, now a politician, and uh, we're trying to trying to sort of bottom out what what this means and in particular we were trying to get a handle on whether or not any response from the west which would be u.s led um, but any response would be geographically linked to ukraine or or completely divorced from the geography of ukraine that i.e saying to russia look we can hit you anywhere we want we you, you will you will suffer pain and it will be a completely it'll be a place of our choosing so geographically linked and secondly, whether or not it be conceptually linked. In other words, do you meet like for like? So, so firstly, weapons, nuclear weapons or conventional weapons, or do you go for something completely separate? Do you go for the economy? Do you go for satellites, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and uh, so we were sort of bottoming out these, these sorts of ideas. I spoke to retired Major General Rupert Jones as well, who used to be commander of um, Britain's Standing Joint Command, and he was talking about vertical and horizontal escalation by vertical escalation being that you respond in kind so just sort of more of the same so would 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 this be would the west use nuclear weapons in response a uh, horizontal escalation being you just you go you go what as in you know the, the as the image sort of lends itself you go wider you don't go you don't go up this sort of military chain you use the economic means or, or other means at your disposal so i mean no no great answers but just just ways to think about it rather than things to think of but the the broad consensus seemed to be that that firstly satellites were were out out of it partly because that was deemed um, it, it has been discussed by the P5 members of the UN Security Council and space based assets are at the moment off limits for military activity there's there's a uh, push at least on paper not to militarize and weaponize space um, it was also felt that if you were to attack if one was to attack russian satellites that would be that would interfere with their nuclear firing chain and that it, specifically anything that interdicts with russia's nuclear firing chain is one of their uh, one of their causes to use nuclear weapons so that was deemed satellites are deemed too too close to to nuclear and also um not sufficiently tied geographically to um to the war in, in ukraine so the, the view seemed to be that there would be some. There would be a military response as well as a diplomatic slash economic response. That it'd be very much tied to Ukraine, to to the war in Ukraine, the invasion um, from Russia, and most likely it would be to try and target the the unit that fired uh, the weapon or weapons, uh, the command and control around that, any radars, uh, etc., pr- protecting it and supplying information for it. So very very specifically tied, militarily tied to not only the ge- geographic limits of Ukraine and and the area we, one can assume of Russia or the sea from which a weapon came, but also very much tied to the to the issue itself, rather than, for example, um, having a go at the, the fleet in Vladivostok or Mamansk or something like that. Now, there, there might be other responses, sink the Black Sea Fleet, for example, but, but it would be very, t- very much tied geographically to Ukraine and not um, not too far divorce such that it um, that it just exponentially spreads the war so wide that there are unintended consequences and fires breaking out all over the place but you know, a more a more nuanced version of, of that little ramble in uh, in the paper today and online well thanks very much for that dom hamish you've been listening to this and also writing about the nuclear tensions uh, what's your take
Thanks very much for having me on and, and good afternoon. And uh, I, I absolutely agree with Dom's sentiments there and, and Rupert Jones and others who he has um, been interviewing for that piece in the paper today. I, I think there are three things to look at here. Um, there are the strategic nuclear weapons. And without going into the great details, uh, these are the, the sort of massive intercontinental ballistic missiles. We're talking in megatons. This is a million tons of TNT equivalent. So absolutely massive. And the largest Russian one is thought to be called the Tsar 57 megatons, 57 million tons of TNT. I personally believe that the, uh, the, the likelihood of strategic nuclear war is, is so unlikely that, that we probably need to park it. So I think it is confusing the whole situation there. I say that because it's in nobody's interests at all to destroy the planet for the next couple of de generations. But I do believe that the nuclear piece is sort of Putin's uh, ace card at the moment. Everything else is going incredibly badly. And um, that, that has been covered very well. And we've seen Medyev and, and Markov again getting into the, into the discussions, threatening nuclear, because I think it is a key ace that the Russians have and, and they don't have a huge amount at the moment. And, and brinkmanship is, is all that it's about. The, the, the next level of nuclear usage um, is very much the tactical that everybody is talking about. And in simple terms here, we're meaning, you know, fairly small compared to the um, strategic. These are uh, measured in kilotons. So thousands of tons of TNT uh, equivalent and the Russians have ones between about three and 10 kilotons. You know, e even so, these are massive explosions that would create a tremendous, you know, a a amount of contamination. Um, so those are the ones that I think people are focusing. The third element to it, which I'll come back, is the weaponization of nuclear power stations. And we've spoke before about Zaporizhia. Maybe we might want to have a little update about that. Um, and we also saw last week one of the other nuclear power stations uh, very nearly taking a hit from a strategic, from a, a, a precision guided missile, which you know wouldn't have created a, a nuclear explosion as per a, a nuclear weapon, but would have created you know a, a lot of contamination. But going back to the the point about the the most likely use being the tactical, um, I have written recently and uh, and in the Telegraph on Sunday about you know I, I think there are some real questions on the viability of the tactical nuclear weapons that the Russians have. You know, are, and most of them are on, I scanned the uh, sort of big trucks, uh, missile launchers, um, which uh, would need to travel some considerable distance to get them in range of Ukraine. And the last intelligence updates we had, admittedly a few weeks ago, um, the UK and, and the US and NATO uh, said that they hadn't seen any movement here. So when you look at what we could possibly do um, in return, if they do use nuclear weapons, you know, one option is to take out the tactical launchers. Um, now, I think this is possible. I've said, you know, what, what state they're in. Um, you know, I, I expect the vehicles, the Iskanders and the other vehicles these are mounted on, are, you know, if they're in as poor order as the rest of the Russian military equipment, um, that's not very good. The second point is I am sure that our intelligence will pick them up as soon as they start their engines and start to move. So I expect part of the um, piece in yesterday's paper about the catastrophic response um, might well be, I would hope, that Putin, uh, that, uh, Putin is being told by Biden and the US administration, you start moving those Iskander uh, nuclear missile launchers around and we will take them out or, or or certainly we will align our cruise missiles and other precision guided weapons to be able to take them out. So I think that is a, a very real thing that we could do. And, and on the basis that they are, you know, it, it, we again get quite some some warning of that. So I think that that is, you know, a real consideration uh, to look at. And and going back to the the, the third element um, the nuclear power stations, 
uh, very interesting looking at the Russian news agency TAS just before coming on air. You know, some incredible stuff on there, not least the fact that the referendum results are already in. And, and as Dom has said, everybody's voted uh, for those um, for the annexation of those four states into Russia, uh, w- w- which is a concern. Um, but also on TAS today, they're saying that the Russians have agreed uh, that um, uh, Rafael Grossi, who's head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, can carry on with the planning and development of a demilitarized zone uh, around Zaporizhia. Um, so, you know, what, what, what that actually means, I don't know. But I think taking Zaporizhia out of the equation here is, is absolutely a, a key uh, and fundamental piece to it. Um, I'll, I'll just pause for breath there because I expect you might have some questions in follow up. Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much for that, Hamish. There's there's an awful lot to, to get into here. Um, I've been writing down quite a few questions as you've been as you've been talking. Um, to start in no particular order, you mentioned some of the secret discussions we've heard about between the Americans and the Russians. Um, do we have a sense of? Could you give us a sense of what might be being said privately? I mean, we know that. The, the White House came out and said that there be you know, that, that there would be what was it, what was the quote catastrophic destruction if the Russians did use nuclear weapons. Um, what are, are they able to be a lot blunter in private? Would they be able to say, look, we're going to hit X, Y, Z? Could you give us a sense of of how these these discussions behind closed doors are conducted? Well, well I I have no insider insight as such. I expect they'll be on two levels. I expect first of all there will be the the check that the checks and balances for pressing the red button for the strategic um, capability, all the checks and balances are in place. So there's there's no. I mean, we 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 heard a number of people a few weeks ago saying, you know, we're 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 a, we're, we're just you know a, a nuclear um, accident away from a miscalculation or misjudgment. So I'm sure you know the the, the staff in both. Uh, the White House and the Kremlin are just checking that, you know, everything is in place so that uh, things aren't escalated by accident or or miscalculation. I I expect on the other level, um, you know, it has, and it slightly to me goes back to the Obama red line in in Syria, um, when uh, Obama very clearly said in September 2012 that any use of chemical weapons in Syria would, would, in, in effect, have a catastrophic response uh, that, that we're talking about at the moment. And of course, you know, almost a year to the day later, in the 21st of August 2013, we had that massive nerve agent sarin attack in Ghouta, and and basically we didn't react to that red line. So I would be hoping that uh, Biden is making it absolutely clear to Putin that uh, this is not a chemical weapon red line from Syria. This is a nuclear uh, red line that the US and NATO will not sit on their hands this time. You know, I I do accept it's incredibly difficult to find the right response to it. But I'm sure I would hope Putin has been saying, move your launchers and we will light them up with our radar or whatever it is. And if you don't stop them, we will, you know, have the opportunity to take them out. And I expect also all the other areas that uh, was covered in Dom's piece today, you know, taking out cattle ships. You know, we, we know when the Russian flagship in the in the Black Sea was taken out, the impact that had on Russian morale and and uh, and the anger in the Kremlin. So, you know, these are absolutely prized assets. I think um, I think the Ukrainians are already taking out command and control centers uh, with a high Mars anyway. So uh, the Russians are pretty jittery about that. You know, I, I think ultimately um, it is is hopefully Biden is is calling Putin's bluff because you know I think that it is. It is. And if you you know accept my thesis that this is his ace card, uh, and I've also written about the unconventional warfare. Uh, when your conventional fails, you go to unconventional, which is really attacking civilians at the heart of your battle plan, the hope being that if civilians capitulate, the military will follow. Well, you know, that might have worked in other places Russia has attacked, but, you know, it's clearly not working uh, in Ukraine. So without an insight, I hope 
you know, the American administration are making it very clear that, first of all, their lines are absolutely open on the strategic issue and that Putin knows exactly what he's going to get if he does anything more than just hype up the rhetoric on nuclear usage. Yes, that's. Ex- I mean, that was exactly what my next question was going to be, actually. And I guess maybe to bring in Dom as well, um, if if you're right, and this uh, and and this is Putin's ace card, and his bluff is called, um, it's one of the issues now that we we don't actually know what comes next. If the, if this is really the last roll of the dice, the last sort of big thing that uh, the Russian leadership can can play, um, we're, we're really into some unknowns after that, are we not? Uh, yes, if I jump in, I think I think we are. I made the point yesterday, nod to my, my friend and colleague Shashank Joshi at The Economist, should be following him on Twitter as well, great guy. He made the point that, that for whatever reason, if, let's say, Russia do use nuclear weapons, whatever their reasoning behind that, whatever battlefield con- advantage they think it would confer upon them, or wider diplomatic advantage, and I'd like to ask Hamish about that in a moment, but whatever their reasons were for using these weapons, those reasons will still be there the day after any retaliation, unless unless that retaliation was overwhelming. And there's a huge risk in, in you know having an overwhelming response coming straight out of the blocks and, and uh, you know, providing that kind of response. So, so, yes, you're absolutely right. What comes next? They should, any, any sensible military planner and I'm not necessarily including Russia in that, which is worrying. But any sensible military planner will be uh, the old mantra of think to the finish. You know, don't just see that action. Ha, ah, bingo, that's that's going to do it. I'm going to win the game of risk. No, you've got to think through that and think beyond it. And, well, what if, what if it doesn't work? As Rupert Jones says in the article I wrote, you've, you've got to have all these all these options in the playbook. Doesn't mean you're going to use them, but you've got to have them and think through, well, if I use that and it doesn't work, what do I then do? What's the situation then? How has it changed? How have my actions changed the situation? And how, how do I respond to that? So, yes, you would hope that they are absolutely thinking through all these all these considerations uh, and wargaming every possible eventuality. But I'd be very interested to hear from, from Hamish. Hamish, great to have you on. Great, great to chat to you again. What do you think the reason for Russia's use of nuclear weapons would be at this at this point? I know that sounds like a pretty silly question, but given the size of Ukraine and the the, the the way that Ukraine's forces are dispersed, a small, in inverted commas, nuclear weapon is not going to dent the, the Ukraine defence here, is it? I mean, why would Russia use a nuclear weapon? Well, you're, you're right, I think, to do a degree. Each individual tactical nuclear weapon is, you know, is not massive. All those 3,000 kilotons of um, 3,000 tonnes of conventional explosive is still fairly massive. And I think the um, what one is, a lot of people, a lot of experts, I suppose, like like me and others, are focusing on the explosive uh, nature of a nuclear weapon. Actually, you know, it is the radiation and the contamination that creates most of the problem. So, you know, even a, a three or five kiloton device uh, set off in central Ukraine would have impacts not only across Ukraine, but across Europe as well. So I, I think we, we, we need to um, also think about the other implications of a, of a nuclear strike. And we are sort of, I think at this stage, we're sort of assuming that the Russians are going to fire one tactical nuclear um, weapon in order to create the conditions for their um, perceived success in future. Um, whether it is to bring... NATO to the negotiation table and accept and try and get them to accept what appears to be what the Russians are trying to get a status quo with the annexation of these four states and the securing of Crimea. I mean, that is that seems to be one of the um, views coming out from people like Medvedev and, and others. But I, I agree on the planning side. I'm not I'm not sure that you know, the Russians are planning much beyond the next event. They seem to be planning very much in sort of one or two dimensions rather than, you know, three or four dimensions. And exactly as you say, you know, above and beyond the now, um, what, you know, what happens next uh, and what, where does it go? But, you know, I, I think it is far from, um, far from likely that the Russians will be able to use these tactical nuclear weapons, perhaps for the reasons 
um, that I said. And and a singular use, which a number of people are suggesting, I'm I'm not sure I I sort of understand that. I, I, but I also agree, you know, I, you know, for the for 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 the US and NATO to respond in kind uh, with nuclear, I I think is is probably again highly unlikely. Um, I, I heard Richard Dannett speaking this morning, um, discussing some other ways that it can be done, and, and of course. Uh, as you've covered in the paper quite a lot, there are many other um, activities can, that can be um, uh, enacted by the US and NATO uh, and precision strikes with some of the very sophisticated weaponry we have on some key areas, I think are probably more likely. So I still think the nuclear issue is, is there is a lot of bluff and brinkmanship about it. No doubt the planners at NATO, London and in Washington are, are, are preparing contingency plans uh, and what to do. But I think it is, a, it is a time where, you know, if, if you accept my argument that perhaps, you know, the tactical nuclear weapons might not be in a great state and we will get fair warning of their use, um, I think NATO and the US should, should negotiate from, from a position of strength and absolutely focus on these things not being used. Um, and I still, you know, one of my earlier comments, I'm still hugely concerned about the weaponization of nuclear plants, which I think is could be more likely and, uh, if not as deadly, certainly psychologically as damaging. On that, Hamish, I'm just looking at the report now. Uh, this is um, about five, six days ago, a missile was fired at the Pevdenutskransk nuclear plant, the second largest in Ukraine. It landed, uh, we think, 300 metres from the reactor. I wanted to ask your reading of this. Do you think um, that was a threat or did the Russians miss? Or is that the point? We don't actually know. And that, and that's the, that, that strategic ambiguity is, what, is what's so scary. Uh, a- a- absolutely. I think, I think both sides are using strategic ambiguity um, to, to keep the others guessing. I, I would have thought that is probably more a shot across the bows, um, uh, that, you know, we're all focused on Zaporizhia, but of course there are another um, four nuclear power stations. You know, these are precision-guided weapons that the Russians are using, although, you know, we we have been surprised of their, um, you know, of the, of the Russian military performance here for a precision-guided missile to mo- miss by 600 metres. You know, it is is you know, the same as missing by hundreds of miles, if if that's not 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 a, an oxymoron. So I expect a shot across the bows. Um, lots of other experts will say, well, you know, these nuclear power stations are designed um, to to take a lot of you know flak, even for an aircraft crashing into them. Uh, and again, without going into the technical detail, a precision guided missile, you know, is. It is is not an aircraft crashing into them. You know, it is very specific, and and should you know be able to be guided very accurately. And a precision guided missile hitting a nuclear reactor is likely to cause some sort of chain reaction uh, and some sort of nuclear accident. So, very long answer to your question. I expect it's a shot across the bows. Um, but I think we're all getting to re- to understand, and certainly my, you know, my, my line on unconventional warfare, there does not seem to be anything that the Russians are, are not prepared to do um, in order uh, for them to to get ahead in this conflict. So, you know, I, I wouldn't it, it wouldn't surprise me if the next precision guided missile uh, actually hits a reactor. Well, thank you very much um, for that, Hamish. Uh, Dom, I know you had a few questions as well. Do you want to come in? Yes. Thank you, David. Um, so, Hamish, throughout this chat, we've been talking about, you, you've mentioned as soon as these things start to move, the West should should try, should hit them. Um, and we've also talked about one of the likely responses or more most likely response after any attack would be to target the launch vehicle or launch unit. So all this presupposes that that we would accept Russia saying, ah, attack by NATO on Russia. Right, we're off. So do you think there's, when we're talking about response to nuclear activity, it is understood between Russia and the West that that all bets are off, but that does not mean 
war between NATO and Russia, that, that we can contain the response to the to the specific action. And I'm just noted that that the, the, the Britain's chief of the defence staff, so the head, of, well, literally the head of the whole shooting match, um, Admiral uh, Sir Tony Radikin, had the Russian defence attaché or met the Russian defence attaché in Britain's MOD here in London yesterday. And I wonder if, if these were the kind of conversations they'd be they'd be talking about. So what do you think is the is the the the, the agreement, the big boys agreement when, when it comes to NATO and Russia firing at each other post some nuclear event? I don't know. And I suppose this is this is the great conundrum. I do sort of if we focus back to Syria and I know I probably talk about Syria far too much and the uh, and the Syrian playbook R- after the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, wrong. Absolutely wrong. After the use of chemical weapons in Syria, although we didn't react in um, August 2013, we did react in August, in um, April 2017, when, again, the Syrian regime used nerve agents in a place called um, Khan Shakun, and we had precision strikes inside Syria against their chemical weapons uh, development areas. And that brought a stop to it until um, 2018, uh, again, April 2018, when we saw chemical attacks in another suburb called Douma. And after that, uh, Britain, America and France, uh, strategic attacks to take out the remaining uh, of Assad's chemical weapons program. Uh, and thank God we, we haven't really heard much of it since then. So um, I think uh, I would hope that the uh, Russian defence attaché has been told very clearly that, um, that that is what we would do. Those are the sort of things that we would do. Um, and that we would prevent them being launched in the first place it, to, to the sort of scenario I've, uh, I've suggested. Or I think as, other, uh, as others suggested, you know, we would then take out those units that, that had fired these missiles. Um, or, and, you know, with that, I'm, I'm sure there'll be lots of people that, out there saying, hey, we're just talking about tactical nuclear missiles. Um, there is also a tactical nuclear weapon that could be put on an aircraft and um, some artillery shells as well. But I, I think the focus is probably on the missiles because they are um, they, they are likely to be more accurate. And of course, you know, the Russian aircraft are going to have to get, you know, into Ukraine airspace, I expect, to, to drop these munitions. So whereas the Skander missiles can stand off about um, 300 miles. So that, that is what I hope would be saying, so that um, you know one would expect the Russians to keep up the rhetoric and the bluff because that's what they're trying to do. And of course, we, we've discussed in the past about Soviet and Russian doctrine in this area. You know, what is really concerning us all is, you know, with the uh, sham referendum and annexation of these four states, um, I think as Medvedev said yesterday, you know they will they are they will in fact in effect become Russia um, by the end of this week, and I gather Putin is making an address on Friday, which no doubt he will say that there was a 97% turnout in the referendum, uh, a 97% um, uh, uh, call for yes to join Russia, and a 99% turnout. Uh, and as Taz has already announced, that one shouldn't be too surprised. So I think. Uh, Again, a very long answer to your question, Dom. Hopefully that's what the Russians have been told. Um, they'll keep up the rhetoric, but one is hoping in the back. They know that if, if they do flex this muscle, it, it will get well and truly punched. Just one more question from me, Hamish. Um, what, how good is our knowledge of Russia's nuclear arsenal? Do we, do we have a very good understanding of the kind of weapons they have, where they are, or are there areas where we're not so sure? Well, again, I, <laughs> I, I, I have no insider knowledge here as such, but I think generally we have a pretty good, um, uh, pretty good understanding. Uh, basically, the Russians have about 6,000 warheads and so does the US and the West. So there is parity um, in, uh, in warheads and capability. Um, I think we have a pretty good idea. I think in in public we have a pretty good idea where the you know, majority of this stuff is. I, I would hope that um, we we have a you know a much better idea 
Um, and I'm sure the intelligence networks, you know, th these are the sort of, you know, critical information requirements that they they focus on. So I would, you know, with, with all the, you know, the, the nuclear piece has been around for 70 years now and uh, the various um, negotiations, SALT uh, talks uh, and everything else, non-proliferation between nuclear powered countries um, would mean that I think everybody has a, a relatively good idea. They probably don't have 10 figure grid references where these things are. But, um, you know, in, it's very difficult to do anything on the planet these days without somebody seeing or picking things up. So I think when I when when I talk rather casually of, of an Iskander lorry firing up its engine to start to move, um, I expect that uh, that would be picked up. And the fact that but both the UK and the US governments have said in the last, well, not, not for a couple of weeks, admittedly, that they have seen no movement of, uh, of, of the Russian um, strategic or tactical, tactical uh, nuclear capability. What one, I think it's a fair assumption to know that we, we, we have pretty good intelligence about these things. And no doubt the Russians know quite a lot about, um, you know, the US and, and our own nuclear capability. Thanks, Hamish. Dom, I know you've got one or two more questions. Yes, thank you. Um, so, well, we've, we've talked nuclear for well, quite a while so far. Um, why have we jumped straight to nuclear, Hamish? What lessons have, could you talk to us about from Syria, about chem bio, less, less the bio, I guess, but, but chemical weapons? that We've seen them used, you have seen them used, very up close and personal. If you wish to share any of those, then, then please do. Don't feel you have to. Uh, those stories um why why do we think russia would go from conventional to nuclear and skip uh, the chemical step uh, that that is a really really interesting question you know i have um sort of one, one of the sound bites and i'm just preparing a, a lecture i've been asked to to give in my my role as a fellow at cambridge in a couple of weeks time uh, which is a, a huge huge challenge in itself um, but, and it's about unconventional warfare. Uh, and one of my lines has always been, you know, if you have no morals or scruples, you'd use chemical, biological or nuclear weapons all the time because they're so morbidly brilliant. So, you know, what, why have the Russians not gone to chemical when, you know, chemical is, is deniable? I, at the very beginning of this conflict, you might remember there was a lot of false flag stuff coming out of the Kremlin about chemical weapons being prepared in Ukraine, biological weapons being prepared by both the, the US um, and the Ukrainians, w which was absolutely uh, ridiculous. I mean, we have seen a few chemical facilities uh, directly bombed by the Russians, again, in the early part of the war, uh, an ammonia factory to the east of Kyiv, um, which, you know, the only reason to do that was to create some sort of imprised chemical device. I, I think why, why the Russians haven't used it, we, we, we're, we're pretty sure they still have an extant chemical weapons program. Um, I, I'm talking today from Salisbury, which everybody will remember where you know, the Russians use the deadly, most deadly chemical ever produced on the planet called Novichok. Um, you know, why are, are they not using that? I mean, I think because it's not an, a wide area weapon, my my view of the Russian unconventional warfare is to try and intimidate the civilian population, uh, and the the way to do that is is by by mass rather than you know surgical strikes, which Novichok probably is. Um, ha having said that, of course, you know the Syrians just use chlorine, you know the the the, the most widely used chemical in the world um the, you know everybody uses bleach i expect to to clean their sinks that in effect um is chlorine and um the psychological impact is, is massive and you mentioned I, I was the peshmerga's chemical weapons advisor for two years in the fight with isis and uh, isis fired some chlorine mortars at us uh, and the Peshmer men and women of the peshmerga the bravest people you'll meet in the world but they were absolutely terrified again it was it was a uh, uh, a, a lot of it was a lack of understanding, but once we did a lot of training and all the rest of it, we overcame that, and and then that that failed to become, you know, a significant weapon. I mean, interesting enough, we we did the same in Syria um, because again, these chemicals attacked, you know, were focused on the civilian population, um, and generally civilians 
are susceptible to, to these weapons because they have no means of protection. Once you train them what to do, it then nullifies it. So what one has been trying to uh, do that um, in Ukraine as well. So I think, I think the, the fact that the Russians haven't gone to Kenbio because it probably wouldn't be as effective. And the nuclear, w w with Kenbio and nuclear, the psychological impact is, is so massive. And I think that's why the Russians have gone to that. I don't think they have thousands of tons of chemical weapons uh, lying around the place and the biological thing. We, you know, we, we could talk for weeks about why, why I don't think that's viable. But, but the nuclear is. And every, you, know, you, you don't need to do much explanation about nuclear. You know, if I, if I, 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 you know it, it would take me a, a good hour to explain to you why, you know, a, a Lassa fever, you know, is a deadly pathogen and we need to be really concerned about it, especially if some synthetic biologist splices it with, with a pathogen that's more transmissible. But, but when it comes to nuclear, you know, everybody can picture those mushroom clouds in their mind. Everybody knows the thousands and thousands of people who died in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at, at the end of the war. And, um, you know, the, the, it, it, it's within our psyche. So I think for the Russians, it's, it's a, an easier terror weapon to use. And going back to my statement about if you have no morals or scruples, well, I, I don't think Putin is showing any indication he has either of those. So for, for me, that's, and, and just the final piece on that, Dom, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at short, sharp answers uh, in this case, but, you know, when, when your conventional weaponry is failing and failing so badly, you, you need to bring an ace, you need to bring the rabbit out of the hat. And I, I think that's, that's, why, that's what nuclear is for the Russians. You make a really interesting point that, that a large part of this is about intimidating, scaring the civilian population. So are we not adding to that by talking about this? Or flip side of that coin is how do we get back to the, the sort of 70s and 80s with those leaflets that were distributed, certainly in this country? I don't know if other, other countries around the world, I'd be very interested to hear from our listeners. But we had these leaflets literally mm -hmm. posted through every door about what to do at home in the event of a nuclear attack. And that was part of hardening society, preparing society, of course, but, but hardening society psychologically to these things. And we were able to, as horrific as it was, we were able to talk about it without, without all being you know, suddenly terrified into inaction. Whereas now I, we're not quite there. I'm not, I don't think we're being terrified into inaction, but, but we are in a different place. And, and Putin is kind of driving the initiative here on the nuclear debate. We... It could be argued that we are adding to this to this fear by discussing it on on pods like this. So how do we get ahead of the game here? How do we get in front of the narrative to be able to talk about these things and how to prepare society and make society more resilient to this stuff without scaring yeah. people? Uh, it's a great point. I mean, it's a fine balance between reassurance and terrifying people. And you, you guys won't be old enough to remember back in the Cold War when exactly we had leaflets and, and black and white BBC sort of films telling you what to do. Um, but, but interesting enough, you know, I, I, think, I think the US are, are ahead of us this on this. Um, the Department of Homeland Security um, issue a, 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 a little aid memoir. In fact, I've got it on my desk here. Um, uh, and it's basically you know, what to do in the event of, of a nuclear explosion and um, how to prepare yourself. Um, and it's, it's all fairly matter of fact. And I think, you know, the great thing about these sort of things, you know, I expect a lot of people think nuclear is certain death. Well, that, that is just not the case. There are an awful lot of things that, that you can do, but it's, um, you know, balanced against likelihood of use and everything else. But it goes back to my one of my earlier points about the psychological impact of Kembaya and nuclear is, is tenors to one, the physical, although you could argue that for nuclear. Um, what we found in Syria is that um, if we could train the population and give them an idea how to survive, and, and it was completely bizarre. You know, many times in Syria um, when, you know, people were being killed by bombs and bullets all the time, people were still more terrified of chemical weapons. And you know, I remember saying to a, a chap in a, in, in um, a place near Aleppo, 
you know, what is the issue here? Uh, and they said, Hamish, we can hide from bombs and bullets. We can't hide from gas. Um, so in a way, teaching people how to hide or get away from it take, takes the um, takes that psychological nightmare of it out of the way. And it's exactly the same in northern Iraq with the Kurds and the Peshmerga. When people knew what to do, it then it didn't become the, the, the deadly thing that it was. So, and I think the same um, in, in Ukraine as well. It, it's like it's like any threat or any weapon. You know, if somebody who wants to use them uh, understands or believes they're not going to be as effective as they want, then they'll think twice uh, about doing it. So I do. I mean, I, I probably like yourselves. You know, lots of people do say, and I, no doubt I'll get a whole load of pieces after this saying you, you're terrifying everybody. Well. You know, everybody, it, it's quite a terrifying world at the moment. Wouldn't you prefer to be better informed so that you have a, a better chance of coming out of this in a good place rather than sticking your head in the sand uh, and getting, you know, uh, and uh, and being affected because you were not, uh, you didn't have your head up and you didn't know what to do in the event of something. So it's a fine line. I accept that. But uh, I think, uh, you know, I personally think it would be a good idea just to remind people of some basic things that that can be done in the event of you know although we're talking about ambiguity you know and we're hoping this won't escalate beyond where it is at the moment you know it could do however unlikely so i think it would be wise that people have a rough idea of what to do as as i did as a kid as a child and you know our parents and grandparents um did uh back in the day well, thank you very much for that, Hamish. Um, Dom, just one question to you. Um, we've been talking in the past few weeks about the Ukrainian counterattack, and I remember you saying that effectively on the battlefield now, the momentum is all with Ukraine. That the, it's the Ukrainian armed forces that can decide when to attack, where to attack. They're dictating the the, the pace of of the of the war now. Um, from the mobilization to these nuclear threats, do you think, do you see this as Vladimir Putin desperately trying to regain the initiative? Because once again, we're talking in hypotheticals about what Russia might do and might, why they might do something or might not. But do you think this is potentially part of that, that they've lost the initiative on the battlefield and this, this is one way of trying to seize it back? Yes, partly. I completely agree with that. Um, I mean, we spoke about this briefly while you were away mixing your tequilas the other day. Um, I absolutely think that's correct. So, so it's slowed that the, the front line has calcified a little bit since the push through in Kharkiv a couple of weeks ago. But I, I still think the momentum is with Ukraine in as much as they get to choose where and when to attack. I don't think Russia has that has that capability at the moment. So what's Putin done? He's tried to introduce other um, issues into the uh, into this fog of war. So he's introduced the politics with these referendum that we're going to see the results of today he's introduced mobilization so he's trying to do other, other bits and pieces to to broaden out the war because we have to provide an answer to each of those and they all take time and politics and horsepower and it's headlines and it's and it's diverting people away from the the battlefield uh, russia's lack of battlefield success so no i think it's absolutely all all wrapped into into the same thing of course the massive downside for putin is that up until, well, basically up until the airstrikes on the Saki airfield in Crimea, I would argue, very little of this news, news of the war, actual proper news, accurate news of the war, had had fed into Russian society. It was only after Saki was was hit that we then saw those huge traffic jams to get off Crimea, and uh, those images would have would have gone through all the all the social media channels inside Russia. And suddenly people would start to hear and see things. Now, at the time, that would have fed into, ooh, look at those nasty Ukrainian Nazis. They're bombing our lovely beach resorts. But it was the start of news getting in there. And then with the mobilisation and, and the response to that, which is still ongoing, it's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, it's now running running riot. Russian society has to willfully count itself out of the news game now if they don't want to find out about news. And actually, maybe that won't even work. It's going to come to them whether they like it or not, for, for the vast majority who have who are either male or male relatives and, and what have you. So by Putin, by spreading this war out to, to mask these battlefield reversals, I mean, he's opened up 
if you like, a new flank, the information flank inside his own country. And that is that is potentially extremely dangerous for him because it's Russian society. If, if the if the mood were to turn against him, against the war and against him personally and what he's doing to Russia and what people can see he's doing to Russia's future, then that is extremely dangerous for him. So, no, it's all wrapped all wrapped in together. And I think it's it it's backfiring on him, which is why the whole nuclear question is is very, very dangerous because that, that seems to be the, the sort of last as as Hamish says the last ace he has and that is why it's that is getting the attention that it that it deserves thanks Dom and thanks Hamish I think we're coming to the end of our time uh, today so can I just ask you both for your final thoughts what should our listeners be thinking of in the days to come well if I could jump in there please just so we, uh, Hamish can have the last word it's got to be the referendum today the, the results um see what the see what the numbers are there as i said yesterday there was there was there was there was good uh, intellectual chat about well maybe the the the, the Kherson and zaporizhia oblasts will vote against joining russia and this could be a way of putin backing down pulling his forces back saving a bit of face so on and so forth i mean i i, I would like that to happen i don't think that would be the end of the war i would not want that to be the end of the war but i I think that would be a clever response. I just can't see it happening. I don't think there's going to be anything other than uh, overwhelming support for for rushing back to a former Soviet, you know, glory. Um, but yeah, keep keep our eyes on the on the numbers coming out from these referendums. Thank you, Dom and Hamish. Would you like the final words? Yeah, just from from my perspective, I, you know, I do think this is Putin's final ace. Um, I think uh, we we have got to be you know, very resilient uh, and to uh, call his bluff here. I'm delighted that the Americans are are talking to the Russians, you know, off record, as it were, making them absolutely clear uh, what is the potential if they use uh, nuclear weapons. But um, and I think we need to be prepared for, for a various different eventualities. The key thing is, you know, the British government, NATO and the Americans uh, need to hold their nerve and make sure that Putin realizes that um, you know any any use of nuclear weapons will be number one prevented because we'll take his his uh, uh, launchers out before he can actually use them, and number two will lead to the end of uh, Putin as leader of Russia. Ukraine: The latest is an original podcast from the Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio. And sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, And today on Twitter, Claire Hubble.